Today I have with me Dr. Alex Bezarides. He is a professor of biology at Lewis Clark State College in Idaho and author of Evolution Gone Wrong. Uh, I really like the cover, by the way. It's very cool and yeah, Thanks clean. a lot. There's a, there's a whole story about the cover. We can get into it later. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about that. Okay, so Alex, um, would you would you mind um, just summarizing the book for us, like give, giving the main ideas? We'll talk about the details later, and then we can get into your background. Yeah, the book. To summarize the book, I'd say the book is about the aches and pains of the body, and why they happen. So, looking at all these sort of parts of the body that don't work quite as well as we might hope or expect and how they came to be through an evolutionary perspective. So each chapter tackles a different anatomical area of the body. So the first chapter is about, the first whole section is about issues of the head and neck. And so the first chapter is about like why our teeth don't fit in our mouths and all the things that sort of happened along our evolutionary path that made it so we have this tooth jaw mismatch. and. And that's kind of model a model for the whole book. So then, then I put, then I have a chapter about eyes and where why so many of us have to wear you know, a correction for our vision. It's a chapter on choking. Then in the middle section of the book, I I transition to musculoskeletal issues. So why so many people have trouble with their knees and feet and backs. Of course, back is the the back is the leading cause of disability worldwide, and there there are pretty solid evolutionary explanations behind why that's the case. And the last third is all reproduction. So going through the whole kind of the whole topic of reproduction from the very beginning, even before reproduction and the issue of menstruation all the way through pregnancy and birth. So that's the organization of the book. Um, and then the trick for me was kind of tying it all together. So it doesn't, wasn't just like independent chapters that people could just pull out. And mm -hmm. I was a little worried about that in the initial stages to, of getting it published. Like I didn't want it to just be sort of this iterative thing where it just, you know, I had to figure out a way to tie it all together and make it kind of a story. And that's why I put it in sections and I kind of try to flow each chapter from one to the next. And that's kind of how it came to be. Yeah, that's a great overview. And also just as you're, as you're talking about all of those different, uh, different body areas or processes you're describing, I'm sure given, given your experience teaching anatomy, it sounds so professional, but th the thing that I was very uh, pleasantly surprised with is the book is how accessible it is and how funny it is. Like I remember in the intro, you said something like, I'm uniquely uh, apt to cover this, this merge between evolution and anatomy, just like Taylor Swift has made a crossover between country and pop. And I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> that's cool. That, that's nice to hear. I wasn't, you, know, you write lines like that and you never know if like it's going to survive the editorial process, you know, because like, I don't know if my editors, you know, that that would connect with them, but they were really good about leaving stuff like that in. And as someone that's taught, I've taught for a long time now, like this will be, I'm on sabbatical this year, but when I get back in the fall, I'll be starting my 17th year teaching full time. And, and I think the book reflects my philosophy in the classroom. Like you have to get the job done and get the ideas in, and get the students thinking for themselves. But at the same time, it doesn't do anybody any good if they're falling asleep and mm -hmm. and it's tough i mean college students have i mean it, it's just a different it's just different now like i have so many students that are they are working they're raising kids they're you know like they have all these pressures that they, they don't just come to class like with well, that's the only thing on their plate that day and they have so you know to keep, mm -hmm. keep you got to keep them focused and you got to keep them alert and a big part of that is is making it interesting and making it fun and and I took the same approach in the book because I didn't want people falling asleep after. You know, yeah, it was it was very fun. I liked all the anecdotes and, and jokes you made. So you also mentioned a few stories in the book about about your childhood, like doing these little experiments or, yeah. or messing around with your brother. So it, it seems like the scientific mindset was there from the start. So so could could you tell me a bit about um, what what first sparked your interest in biology? Yeah, I think yeah. So as a as a kid growing up, we always just spent a ton of time outside. And I think if you're around in the natural world a lot, I mean, it's just, it's it's a really natural thing to do to just kind of start asking questions about how things are, why things are the way they are and how they came to be. And my dad was, my dad's a scientist, he's a geologist and he was always really inquisitive. We'd we'd stop all the time at road cuts on trips and, and, and he'd try and teach us all about the rocks. I kind of went uh, you know the other direction from geology from a very young age because I think he was always trying to 
do geology. So I, I kind of found a different side of science that I really liked, the biological angle. And, and then we could find a place to meet in the middle and we would, which is obviously fossils. So where you, where you mix biology with geology. So we would go fossil dig a lot in Utah and other places. And, and I always found that really interesting. And from a, mm -hmm. from a pretty young age, I was, I was on biology. It took, it took me a while searching for research. I'm not the kind of person that wants to go down one rabbit hole and one rabbit hole. So I've kind of moved around a fair amount in biology, which has given me a, mm -hmm. a broad training and overview. But yeah, all that I was time so, spent outside as a kid, I think. I guess. Yeah, so I, also, I, I saw in your bio, you, you did your PhD in neurobiology, but then in in the early parts of the book, you talk about your background being in evolution, and those those seem like two different fields. So, what were you actually doing uh, in grad school? Yeah, so I went to grad school, and I was really into sort of molecular neuroscience. I guess I would call it. Um, I wanted to study acetylcholine receptors, and I, I didn't like how in undergrad they just always talked about well, acetylcholine binds to the receptor and it causes it to open and then you know sodium ions come flowing through and i didn't like that word cause and that seemed like a big mystery and black box to me so there was there was a lab at cornell um, where the woman studied acetylcholine receptors and i thought well, i'll go off and and do that and that'll be that'll be interesting so i arrived there and and she basically promptly retired <laughs> so she was she was really toward the tail end of her career and she pretty much hung it up like the second I got there. So it was like, okay, well now, now what do I do? So the, the great thing about the grad program that I went into, um, it was the, the division was neurobiology and behavior was that they let you do lab rotations for the first year. Mm -hmm. So I rotated through a few labs um, in the first year and the building was organized. The first floor was just like heavy molecular lab. There was a Drosophila lab down there, a, you know, a fruit fly lab. And there was another one that studied stress in and ion channel physiology. And, and then the middle, the, if you move up one floor, that floor sort of meant to, their approach was to marry neurobiology and behavior. So they looked at the neurobiological underpinnings of animal behavior and, and a couple of rotations through the first floor. And so I spent a summer doing a fruit fly experiments and then I spent a couple of semesters in the ion channel physiology lab and I really thought the work was like I thought the questions were really interesting but I didn't I didn't like being trapped in a lab doing bench work all day every day so I didn't think that was going to work for me for for five years so I I skipped two floors went up to the third floor to a more of a behavior lab it ended up being with a with a researcher, a principal, a PI, a principal investigator named Tom Eisner, um, who was a really famous chemical ecologist. He studied, he studied the, the chemicals that insects produce for defense and reproduction and how they make those and how they use them and everything about their behavior. And, and that, that really worked for me because you got a field component with it where you had to go out and find the animals out in the wild and and then you'd sort of bring the work back into the lab and you'd run little experiments in the lab it was more of a blend of of field work and lab work that worked really well for me so i ended up finishing my phd with tom and and so it was in the neurobiology and behavior department and there were you know i took a lot of classes in neurobiology and i and i ta'd a lot in, in those fields but and in the end Really, my degree was as much in chemical ecology. Okay, that makes sense. So it sounds like uh, a wild journey. <laughs> but so you yeah. mentioned uh, you mentioned in the book, um, in by by the end of your graduate studies, you were enjoying teaching more than research. So you you moved to a teaching position, and then that's how you became involved in in teaching anatomy and and get starting to get closer to, to the topics you cover in the book. So can you tell me a bit about, well, about uh, what that was like? Yeah, so you come out of grad school 
and you've just done all this research for several years and then you have a decision to make like do you want to go and do a postdoc and continue chasing the research path um or do you want to try and get a job teaching at a smaller at a smaller school at a, either a small four your school or at a community college and you get a really good window into the research life when you're in graduate school and while there were parts of it that I enjoyed I didn't want it to be my I didn't want it to be my primary focus I was I was good at it like I'd written plenty of papers and gotten grants as a graduate student and I, I and but I just didn't enjoy the the grind of it enough to want to make a career out of that. And it is a bit of a grind between the grant writing and and all the, you know, the, the writing of papers and the revisions and the statistics and all these, like your your only your time spent focusing on the experiments and the questions can be kind of limited. Um, so I thought I'd try the the teaching piece. I had enjoyed TAing and, and teaching labs in, in grad school. So so I applied for a whole bunch of jobs at at a whole 33 different schools that first year it's hard to get a tenure track job in academia so i applied for a whole pile of jobs and got a few interviews and but if you're going to go out in the world and teach at a small school as a biologist you are going to be asked to teach either microbiology or anatomy and physiology there's pretty much no way around that if you're if you're going to be a, a biologist that focuses that you know that, that's going to teach um, at a community college or a small four years. So, so I got to this interview at this little school in Wisconsin and they flat needed someone. They only had two biologists. It was a pretty small school. And so they had one biologist that covered like micro and botany and, you know, all the non-animal things, but then they, they needed somebody to, to teach a and P and, and I had obviously, I had taken anatomy and physiology and human dissection as an undergrad and, and I'd taken all these classes on physiology, most of it like sort of comparative animal physiology kind of classes as an undergrad and as a grad student. So it's not like it was a total stretch for me. They weren't asking me to you know, teach French or something, but it wasn't totally in my wheelhouse either, but I'm kind of a belief that any biologist worth their salt to teach most biology classes given time to prepare for them. And so we sh I showed up you know, a whole summer early for the job that was to start in the fall. And I got myself really organized and dialed in to teach anatomy and physiology that year and, and off and running. And, and now all these years later, it's still a large part of what I do. Yeah. So how, how much did you know or think about these issues, especially, especially the, the types of questions you, you talk about in the book, like um, why, why our mouths are too small for our wisdom teeth, for right. example, did, did that only come later when, once you were teaching or are they things you've always wondered? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of that did come, come later. I, I taught, so I taught at this little school in Wisconsin for, for four years. And, and then it was just kind of, you're just, you're just running, trying to stay ahead and keep up and, and get, get classes set up. And you spend so much time just trying to keep your head above water that, that I wasn't thinking much outside of, of sort of all right, what, what's what's coming up tomorrow? What's what's the lab the next day, and do I have it prepped and ready? And the first few years of teaching are kind of like that; they're a little bonkers. And then mm -hmm. I we moved. I'm, I'm I'm from the West, and so we wanted to get back to the West, and so I had always kind of kept an eye out for jobs back in the West, and and got this job in Idaho, moved out to Idaho. Then you got another couple of years of. Because even though you're teaching similar classes, it's all different and a slightly different focus. Now I was teaching mostly pre-nursing students and mixed in with biology majors every now and again. And so then I got like that, that, a couple more years go by. And one of the biggest tricks is I had this, this friend, mentor. He taught at um, LCSC, Lewis Clark State College. He taught there for a long time. And, and he and I got to be really good friends. And we talked all the time just about biology, just talking shop. And we would pop in on each other's labs and, and help each other out when there were a lot of students with a lot of questions. And, and he and I, this was right when sort of people were talking about intelligent design a lot. And, and, and we would talk about how there, if you just understood the body and, and all, all, of its, you know, all of its anatomical little quirks, 
it was just so clear that the body was not intelligently designed that it had evolved to be the way it was with all its faults and, and all these different things. And we talked about the throat a lot, Tom and mm -hmm. I did, and how ridiculous it was that the opening to the trachea is so close to the opening to the esophagus and how that was a perfect example of something that clearly was not designed. Like that's not, you just wouldn't design things in such a way that it would, that it would lead you to choking. So that was one of the first times that I kind of got to thinking, well, all right, so it evolved to be that way, but, but why, like how did, like what happened along the path to make it so there's those, such that those openings are so close to one another. And that was one of the first questions I remember asking myself that, that really got me digging into research papers, thinking about that kind of subject. And then, and then the one for teeth was really born out of the classroom. I would show this picture. There's a picture of it in the first chapter of the book of, of the mouth and the teeth just fitting perfectly in the mouth and then I would talk to my class and and I'd have them all raise their hands and I'd say all right how many of you so everybody's got their hand in the air you know 60 70 kids and I would say mm -hmm. how many of you if you've ever had braces lower your hand and that would take out like half the class all right if you ever had your wisdom teeth any wisdom teeth pulled lower your hand all right now you're down to like four hands in the air and then I'd say all right well you know like, Jamie, are your teeth straight after all that? Or are they, you know, and so then, and, you know, and, you know, and Joe, what about you? Like, are you, would you say your teeth are straight? And like, after that, you've got like two kids left whose teeth are actually with all their teeth in their mouth fitting straight. And you realize like, boy, it doesn't look anything like that textbook picture. Like, it's just a mess. So that, that was yeah. one that then I, I started reading about that one. And holy cow, I mean, you immediately get into all these fantastically interesting cultural evolution pieces about about how humans first started using tools and fire and and there's all these different elements to it and that's where i first kind of got turned on to the idea of maybe writing about it because i was just learning all these fascinating things that i that i wanted to share yeah that's exciting i want to take a little bit of a tangent uh partially because you brought up the intelligent design idea and and also it, it just just for our listeners it would be nice to to give kind of maybe a brief overview of how evolution works. And I'm sure most people have like uh, at, at least a basic understanding of it, but um, two, two kind of very contrasting points are, are that on one hand, it's like uh, survival of the fittest and evolution selects for what works best. And it seems like um, there, there are certain things almost, almost built in that will tend to be optimal. So for example, symmetry is something that basically all animals have converged on. Uh, so that that seems to be almost like a fundamental aspect, but then there's other things where it's just like, yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So whatever can survive will survive, whether it's optimal or not. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if you could comment on that, you know, on like on, on to what degree evolution has to guide things towards some ideal state versus to what degree things just continue as long as they're not broken. Yeah, I think I think people kind of get confused about it because they they want something to sort of have this planning and this this I you know this notion of working towards some ideal in the in the future. But it just doesn't it just doesn't work like that. It just works on it works on what is there in the present and and the traits that are most effective in that present moment are the ones that that will be selected for and it's highly dependent on on that current environment and mm -hmm. the minute that that environment changes the minute that you have a winter that starts earlier than it did the year before then all of a sudden selection occurs for traits that are that were very different than the ones that that were there the winter the winter before so the animals that were really selective you know that were really successful and and we're able to, to forge successfully and, and reproduce a ton one winter, you know, those traits may not work at all a couple winters later when, when the environment changes. And, and in that way, evolution just kind of keeps plodding forward. And, and over time, you end up with change in animals. I always tell my, I give my students sort of a, a long winded definition of evolution, but then I also give them what I call sort of the the 10 year definition, the one I want all of them to remember in 10 years, even if they're just like lawyers or flight attendants, or they work at the 
Pepsi bottling plant. Like I don't care where they work in 10 years. Like just remember that effectively what evolution is, is it's just change over time. That's all it is. Um, and, and we can witness that change taking place over short time scales. And, and then we can also witness that change pl taking place over much longer time scales where you end up with you know, species dying out, new species sort of coming, coming in and, and with these really wide scale changes, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the changes in response to environment certainly makes sense to me. I, I, I'm also wondering if there are these, I mean, I, I, I know you mentioned that there's, there's not necessarily progression towards an ideal, but some, there, are, there are some things like against symmetry that seem to sort of be much more universal so with, with that, do you think it's, it's more just like they're universal because it's functionally useful or is there I, something more true to it than? No, I think, I think you hit upon it. I mean, I think, every, I think as, as the process plods along every now and again, it, it stumbles across a form, a structure that, that just works incredibly well. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, there are animals from the early, early days, you know, sponges or, or jellyfish or something that, that don't have this bilateral symmetry, but once by once sort of, once the bilateral symmetry path was hit upon that kind of just trumps largely everything else. And, and then it's just a matter of having tweaks to that bilateral symmetry. How do the, how do the organs work? How do the limbs work? How do, you know, if we throw eyes on the thing, can, is it going to be more effective than things that don't have eyes, you know, and then we, and then you just head down that path. But, but yeah, I think, I think you hit it on the head. It all comes back to the function and, and in the current environment, bilateral symmetry seems to work incredibly well for almost all animals, but, you know, could there someday be a, a, a change that might make it so that that sponges take over sure you know we don't know what's <laughs> going to happen and, and maybe maybe someday it'll be it'll you know bilateral symmetry will work against us but but for now and for the last 500 million years it seems like a pretty good way to go about it as an animal <laughs> yeah that's a, a great foundational point to jump back to the book so what what um did did you originally plan on having these three sections where you focus first on like um on the face and 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 mouth right. and throat um and then you ha you have um talking about our biomechanics so like our knees and feet and spine and then later you talk about babies and reproduction so right. there's did did you plan that or were you just exploring for all of these these uh, cases of evolution gone wrong and then they happen to to kind of fall into these categories I'd, I'd say it's closer to the latter i i wrote so the whole writing a i think this may be I think this is interesting for for people to learn that that haven't you know tried to write a book or haven't done it like i when you write a non-fiction book it's totally different than a fiction book like a fiction book you write the whole book mm -hmm. and then you try and pitch that and you try and get that published and i didn't have any idea i mean i just was i was a biology professor did some research a little bit of research and and i got i hit upon this idea and and so i just I thought that that's how it was. So my, my approach was like, well, I'm just going to kind of slowly write the whole book and then I'll see if I can get it published. And if not, I'll have learned a ton of cool stuff in the process and you know, whatever water off a duck's back. It doesn't, I wasn't worried about it. So I just wrote for like a year or two, you know, I would read papers and read my desk would be covered in journal articles. And, and I just sort of, I explored some of these initial questions I had about like the throat and the mouth and, mm -hmm. and, and after a couple, go ahead. Were you writing notes in, in the form of like a lit review or did you have this uh, kind of lighthearted tone the whole time? No, I had the, I had the lighthearted tone the whole time. I would come out of class with my lighthearted tone and I'd, I'd go right to the office and I'd just put the lighthearted tone right down on paper. So it was kind of always like that. Cause I knew that if anybody was ever gonna read it, I wanted, I wanted it to be fun and accessible and the kind of thing that my students would, would want to read. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole other sort of story there about, about books that we've had our students read in classes that we can talk about. But, but anyway, I, after a couple of years, my wife was like, you know, maybe you should just like spend 10 minutes reading online about how you actually get a nonfiction book published. <laughs> and I was like, all right, fine. Okay, whatever. And so I did. And it turns out there's this whole thing called a book proposal that you have to do in the nonfiction world where you don't write the whole book. You just write um, a, a, a chapter or two, and then all these other sections about why you're the right person to write the book, 
and why there will be a market for the book and chapter outlines and all these different sections. And so I'd spent, I'd spent a year just writing some chapters. I wrote two or three chapters that first year. And then I spent another year putting the proposal together because most of this time I'm just teaching. Like I was, I would dedicate Thursdays to research and writing and I would teach the other days. Yeah. And, and then after two years, I was able to sort of pitch it to a publisher. And, and that was the point at which I, once I put that proposal together, I realized, boy, this thing needs to be organized in, in a way that's not just a bunch of standalone sort of scatterbrained ideas. So then I started sort of looking at what I had down for ideas for things for the book and all right, how can I put this together in, in a way where we sort of have some sections and some continuity. And that's, that's where sort of the head and neck and then musculoskeletal and reproductive part of it came out was that when I really pitched the formal idea. Yeah, and what, what was uh, the editor's initial response to it? Like in terms of how, right. how, how uh, people would, would respond to it? Because it, it, it does seem like a very uh, marketable idea compared to like, you know, evolution of population dynamics or something like that right. would be a lot right. harder to relate to. Right, because everybody has a body, right? I mean, we all yeah. have a body. We all have a body that I don't care what age you are. That's another thing I really tried to focus on and stress throughout the book. And as I did, it was like, I didn't want to just focus on parts that fall apart when we're 75, 85 years old. I wanted to deal with things that a 16 year old might be going through. And, and that was really important to make it relatable to everybody. The, the, the trick to getting a book published in my experience is getting a really good agent. The agent is the, the gatekeeper to the publishers. So you can't actually really just go straight to the, the publishers. They, for the most part, don't accept unsolicited material. So I had to get an agent and, and, and I worked at that for a little while. And I, I had a, two connections out there in the world. Like I had a friend that had written a book. So I went down that path with his agent and he, it got rejected there. And then I had met um, another science writer that had come to the college to speak and, and I had kind of, I had saved his campus presentation talk by teaching him how to mirror his windows on a Mac. Like he couldn't get his thing to present, you know? So like he had remembered me and I got his agent's name and that agent also shot it down. And I was like, all right, well, I've played out all my cards. Like those are the only people in the world I know that, that actually could have connected me to an agent. So I, I was looking at my, um, in my office and I have all these science books in my office. And one of them is the violinist thumb by Sam Keen, just a fantastic science book that about, it's kind of like the, the book, like I've written, but about just about DNA and all the, well, everything that your DNA does for you. And, and just puts a really, really approachable, interesting take on, on DNA. And it was a book that we had used, um, for my student, for, for our students as a common read at the college, meaning every student in a biology class, doesn't matter what the class is from like a, from a non-majors plants and people class all the way up to biochem, every student in that semester would read the violinist thumb. So they all sort of have this common thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the ones that had been really successful. So I opened that one back up and I read the acknowledgements and Sam had talked about his agent and the acknowledgements. And, and so I, I wrote the agent a kind of a query letter, like, hey, here's, here's my idea. What do, you, what do you think? Is this the kind of thing you might be interested in? And he was really enthusiastic right from the get-go. He says, yeah, that sounds right up my alley. Like, go ahead and send me the proposal. And, and I did, and he checked it out. And then we spent about a semester cleaning it up and getting it to look like it was supposed to look, you know, because I had just kind of done the best I could not really knowing anything. And so we made it much more clean and professional. And then after a semester, he, he felt it was ready to to pitch to publishers. And then, so really it was getting an agent excited about it and I was able to do that. And then, and then he gets it out there in, in the world in front of publishers who then take it from there. Yeah, that's great. So you also mentioned there's a story to, to the book's cover. Do you want, do you want to tell that? Or is there anything else in, in, in between the stage yeah. of, of getting it to the, to your agent and then. Yeah. So the, the cover, it's a, it's a title and cover story. And this is where the editor, I think, really shines. So the, my mm -hmm. editors work at work for HarperCollins, and they, 
I had this title in because you have to have something as a working title, you know, as you're going as you're going through. And so the title for me was Mastodon Stew, which is this idea that I hit upon in the first chapter about teeth, where sort of by the time humans were able to make a meal like Mastodon Stew, so they have to have the tools to be able to to hunt and butcher a mastodon they have to have fire so that they can cook it and make it make it tender and falling off the bone and by the time and they have to have a pot so all these things have to have come along and pretty much by the time you have all those advances you don't really need a large powerful jaw anymore and the human jaw once it didn't need to be large and powerful kind of started to to shrink and get weaker and that is kind of the trick to the whole first chapter because the teeth haven't really caught up. The teeth are still bigger than they need to be. And now we have these teeth that don't really fit in our jaw. And so that was, I liked that idea. And I liked, um, I liked that. I thought that was kind of a catchy title. And, and so for years, that was the title. And, and then finally, several years into the project, they, they said, Alex, we just don't think Mastodon stew is, it's going to work as the title. Like nobody's going to know what that means. They're going to have to then read the subtitle or the back cover to have any idea, understanding of what it, what it is. And so then, and I was pretty hesitant because it was kind of my baby and I had worked on it for all this time and, and it was in my head. It was that, you know, mm-hmm. was the and, subtitle the same? Was it the curious reasons? No, part? no. Yeah. No, the subtitle was totally different too. And I forget it was the, the surprising, there were surprising stories in it or something. And mm-hmm. And so I, yeah, the subtitle would made the, made the whole thing a little more clear, but it was also more about like aches and pains in the subtitle. And so I was pretty, I, I didn't fight him on the issue, but I was definitely hesitant. But we, they, we workshopped it out to a bunch of different people, a bunch of people that have read for me. And I tried some, we bounced ideas off the wall for a long time. And then it was Tom, actually, Tom Urquhart, the guy that I talked about that I used to teach with was one that, that threw this idea out there of evolution gone wrong. And that's the one that stuck. And, and there's time and now it's been a year or two since all the, that title workshopping. And as the time has gone on now, I'm now I see that they were right. And I, I kind of view the, the, the job of the editor as, as defending the author from themselves. <laughs> If that makes any sense, like the authors get these ideas <laughs> yeah. that are maybe a little bit harebrained and they have to, you know, kind of just massage the author along and be like, okay, okay. And, you, and, and they've done such a nice job of, of keeping my original voice in the work. Like I, I can still very much hear my voice in the work, but at the same time, when they need to sort of point me in a new direction, they've done that. And, and just the way the book is resonating with people and, and catching people's attention, I know that, that they made the right decision about the title. And then we have, there's a very similar story about the cover. <laughs> yeah. And what would that be? So with the cover, so I had um, my illustrator. So the, there are these great illustrations throughout the book. And I always wanted to have illustrations in the book because I thought it would be a, a neat way to kind of break up the text and, and have this kind of interesting thing in there that helps supplement the text, but also just yeah. kind of a fun little break for the reader to have something to stare at that wasn't just the words on the page. Yeah, and so I had met... those multiple choice questions. Oh yeah. And then multiple choice questions. Cause I'm a prof, you know, to kind of kick off the, to kind of kick off every chapter. So these little things in there to kind of just keep it interesting. And, and I had met um, Peter Davidson, the illustrator when I lived in Wisconsin, he's just this fantastically talented artist. And so he, he did all the illustrations for me. And so we were trying to figure out what to do for the cover. And so I had Peter work up this, this idea of a skeleton kind of with his hands on his head, like kind of in, not in like a pained way, but just sort of like, in like, man, what, like what happened, you know, like kind of expression. And he, and he drew this thing up, but I, I loved it. Like I thought it was really great. And if I ever give, you know, talks about the book, I'll, I'll, I'll show that picture. And, and they liked it a lot too, but I think they were always worried from the get go with the topic about it being too academic and about it, about people sort of thinking, oh, this is just like an anatomy textbook. And why would I want to read this? So they, the editors were very cognizant of, of staying away from anything that might give the impression of it sort of being a little too dry. And so they were worried about, about 
that image just sort of of a skeleton on the cover as being as just being interpreted as just okay here's just another like anatomy book that that will be kind of boring and so then I, I was like well i i don't know what to tell you because i'm kind of out of ideas like the skeleton was kind of my ideas and peter knocked it out of the park and i said so you know and then they're like all right well they, you know they obviously have cover art people so they they went to work and they came up with this this idea of you know a, a primate some some monkey sitting over on one side of the tree and and a human kind of dangling off the branch on the other one as he's just trying to hang on and and the first time i saw it like i kind of wanted to not like it because i liked what peter had done so well and the first time i saw it i was like oh man that's actually kind of awesome it looks pretty good <laughs> so so then we just so then we just ran with it and then and it just came out really great. I'm really thrilled with it. Yeah, I like it. The monkey's face is so serious and the humans yeah. just <laughs> yeah, totally. dangling for help. Like he's looking over there like, what are you doing, man? Like, what, like just <laughs> get it together. Yeah. yeah. So I, so, some of these are more obvious than others. Like I'm sure uh, most, many people have heard about the the wisdom teeth idea, um, like, you know, our, our ape ancestors had bigger jaws and had to chew like these hard roots and chew tubers all day. But yeah. uh, some of them are less obvious. So for example, you talked about the eyes having evolved first in the ocean. And that's, that's why we need to constantly blink and keep them wet. And, and it makes sense when you think about it, but I'm sure most people haven't thought about it. Um, I, I was also wondering though, because it, it paints um, human vision as, as kind of crappy compared to fish. And I, I was under the impression that we had pretty good vision, like just just compared only birds had us beat. And then I thought we were in like second place compared to birds. So is that is that a misconception? I think we're in a very good place for an animal that that lives on land. And I think fish have so many other ways of sensing their environment that for some fish, I think vision might not be quite as important a sense as it is for other fish. Um, I mean, they have like lateral line systems and they have all these different ways of, and, and, and then for some of them, they live so deep that you can't see a thing anyway. So they have to kind of navigate their environment in a different way. I, I think with humans, it's just so important to remember that that transition out of the water happened so long ago, I mean, it was 375 million years ago that that while we might have started with an eye that that was in a totally different environment and we yeah we have to keep it wet and there are some some shortcomings because of that it's a long time to for the eye to kind of slowly work out the kinks and nothing's going to be put through more of the natural selection process than your vision i mean if your vision you know goes as an animal there your ability to gather food, your ability to get a mate, your ability to pass anything on kind of dies quickly. So vision has been a strongly, a highly selected trait over that time. And as a consequence, yeah, our vision now, it's pretty darn good. Um, it just isn't perfect because of, of its origins and, and its watery origins. And then I, and, and this is an important point, which is that not all of these issues are entirely driven by our evolutionary past. Some of the problems we heap upon ourselves with our behavior. And I get into that at the end of the vision chapter by, by talking about how all this time that we spend inside is really, really, you know, the, the, all the modern research and evidence suggests it's, it's not helping the development of the human eye to just spend your developmental years under, under weak fluorescent lighting playing video games. You need to get outside and get natural light in there to get your eye to elongate to the, to the proper, you know, to be the proper length. And, and so it's this combination of our evolutionary past and our modern behavior that makes it so that we have myopia and all these, all these issues people have to deal with. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to talk about there. So we can we can kind of go in evolutionary order. So, ba well, basically, uh, all animals that that live on land or or uh, in the air, I guess, ha had had evolved from these original uh, eyes that that were kind of built for the ocean. So we we have blinking and and all these fluids that you talk about to to keep them from drying out and to keep them working properly. And I would imagine that birds you didn't really talk about in the book, but flying in the air at high speeds 
their eyes would dry out even more quickly and yet they have better vision than us. So do you, do you know anything about how that works? Yeah, so the, the first thing to recognize with a bird is that it's just a flying reptile. So you have to, I, I just even call them avian reptiles in my, in my classes. And so really you're talking about, the question becomes sort of how do reptiles and you know, deal with this issue? And, and one thing that reptiles, and frankly, there's, there, there, are, there are mammals that do this too, is they kind of have a, another eyelid in there. It's called a nictitating membrane. They have another, they have another eyelid in there that, that, that they can sort of more, they can sort of leave over their eyes in most moments for, for, for lubrication and protection. And then when they need to, that thing can come up and then they can get a really clear view of things and they can, you know, they can hunt, they can jump on a mouse, they can do whatever they need to do. And then that nictitating membrane can, can come back down. So I think that's, that's a big part of how many other animals deal with this issue. Um, whereas our, our path and our lineage, we, we lost our nictitating membrane. There's a remnant of them, you know, that little nub in the, the corner of the medial corner of your eye is the remnant of the nictitating membrane. So we obviously had them at some point, but, um, but we, we went down the blinking path instead. It's something that a lot of predators have and we don't, you know, we don't prey that much on things anymore that might, jab is in the eye so it's not something that we have anymore yeah there's there's quite a few of these evolutionary remnants that you mentioned and how how does that process work because at a certain point well i guess it becomes maladaptive to to keep producing whatever this this thing that we're no longer using is like increased energy costs to keep it so we might as well get rid of it but then at some point we don't get rid of the whole thing we stop and we leave this remnant so is that is it, is it like a balancing issue of you want to spend enough energy or you want to remove as much energy cost as possible, but not waste extra time getting rid of things that don't bother you? Yeah, I think I think a lot of it, so I think it's a combination of the energy piece of it, but I also think there's just an issue of, so if it's not being selected for, um, so when the trait is no longer being selected for, then mutations can sort of enter that line that just make it clunky and faulty. And if it's a muscle, it might make it weak or if it's a you know if, if it's a the nictitating membrane then it starts to atrophy and 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 doesn't you know become the same size and so that that happens a lot i brought it up in the vision chapter it's what happened with with color vision humans had the, i shouldn't say humans but the the mammalian lineage that led to humans like it originally had this amazing color vision that that used four different types of pigments in the cones and we could see all these different shades of color, but then mammals effectively just went into the dark and became nocturnal. And when that, for, for a long period of time, and when that happened, there was no longer selection for those, that incredible color vision. And so we came out the back end of that and a couple of those, those proteins, a couple of those photopigments were no longer very functional and they were clunky and didn't work very well. And we were left with only two photopigments that worked really effectively well at all. And that's the way most mammals are set up now because of that little period of, you know, that period of time when, when mammals became nocturnal, they lost their gray color vision. Primates, you know, duplicated one and picked up a third one. So primates are, are trichromatic. They have the three pigments, but all other mammals are now stuck with two, even though they had four. And that's an example of where a trait kind of just got lost in the evolutionary path due to disuse and the accumulation of mutations throughout the tree. And that, that's one where I feel like it probably wasn't that energetically expensive to produce those traits. I mean, we're only talking about, you know, a few proteins produced in the back of the retina, but as soon as mistakes enter that line and end up as mutations in those genes that produce those, those cone photopigments, as soon as those mistakes get in there, then there's no going back. And, and then we came out of that with, with vision, with color vision that was not as good. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I recently watched this nature documentary called Life and Color, and it basically, it was a normal nature documentary, but it also had cameras that would filter um, basically to, to show you how things would look from a certain animal's perspective. Yeah. So it, it was it was showing like deer, uh, gazelle or, or these, these certain prey animals that only had the two uh, color receptors, so they yeah. couldn't see orange. So you see like a bright orange tiger in the middle of 
of this green background and it seems so <laughs> obvious to us but then it yeah. switches the filter on and it's it blends in perfectly so it it, it kind of makes you <laughs> feel, uh, feel more sorry for for the prayer right. um but yeah I never that that's that's kind of a cool uh way to think about it. i never really thought about the advantage to the to the predator of that world. You just think about, oh, would man, it'd be really cool if we could see all these different shades and like see into the UV and all these things. But I never really thought about how for a prey animal, they really like, they really kind of lost out there not being able to spot the tiger in the bushes. That's, that's a cool notion. Yeah, so there, there's two questions there for me. One is, well, why don't you think all animals have been selected for to have the best color vision possible? Especially you mentioned it, it wouldn't be too energy energetically costly. And then the other question is, you, um, you mentioned that for, for primates specifically, we, we redeveloped the third uh, color re receptor because, because it helped us identify ripe fruit. Right. And that, that also doesn't seem like as, as pressing as, as a selector as like avoiding the tiger, because it seems like if you eat an unripe fruit, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. And I think for humans, the like I'm sure the fruit was a part of it, but for me, the thing that humans are just incredible at is seeing green. We can just we can just distinguish a zillion different shades of green. So I, I kind of view it, view it more as probably the kind of thing where you know eat this leaf, but don't eat this leaf, and you know this one's gonna kill you, and this one that looks just barely different is gonna make for a really good dinner. Mm -hmm, um, that makes sense. Now you know what has to happen in there is that one of the genes has to duplicate and that's not something that an animal can just you know that that's that's just going to be a random event that's a mistake that happens along the way at some point when the dna is being is being is is duplicating and dividing for you know just normal mitosis and cellular processes when at some point a mistake gets built in there and there's an extra copy of that of that photopigment gene made and that's not something an animal can Induced, they can't just be like, boy, I'd like to be able to see more shades of green. It's just something that has to happen and then be selected for. So I guess I would just say that, um, you know, the gazelles have just been unlucky enough and that, that something has not come along that, that has given them the ability to, to, to see a tiger in that way. And their, their, their DNA just never duplicated in that same way that the primates happened to along the way. And it could have very easily just gone the other way. It could have very easily that like gene duplication event occurs in that prey gazelle lineage and they end up with the three types and they're able to sort of more effectively stay away from tigers. And we have much more of an issue trying to distinguish different types of green plants, you know? <laughs> right. And so this, this was a very early primate development, but most of the other problems that you talk about come later, um, come, come from when we come out of the trees and start walking on two feet. So could you talk about that a bit? Yeah, that's to me one of the most fascinating times in human evolution. And, and you know, in the conclusion of the book, I, I kind of try and sum it up by saying, you know, if you can only sort of give me a couple things to talk about, about why the body ended up with all these various aches and pains, the, the two things are, the two events are the, the explosion in the size of the human brain and, and the various problems that that call, cause, and that's a big part of the reproductive chapter, obviously giving birth to those huge kids and, and even just getting them through pregnancy. And then the other one is when humans go bipedal, that changes everything for the hominin lineage. Having the hands free all of a sudden leads to all these incredible advantages. I mean, all of a sudden being able to just carry things around and eventually figuring out how to use tools and it, it makes us human to be able to do those things. But at the same time, you take these these feet that were had a job that was relatively similar to that of the hands. It was for gripping and grasping things in the trees and manipulating objects. And all of a sudden you tell the feet, all right, you're done doing that. Uh, now you have to like, just kind of take a pounding walking around on the ground and you don't even get the other two limbs to help you out. It's all up to you. And, and our feet and ankles and knees and everything have suffered quite a bit as a result. You have all these bones down there in the ankle and the and the foot that and all those bones are fantastic when you need to I mean think about what your hands do every time you grip a pencil or or do any you know peel a banana or do the dishes or whatever I'm just looking in my kitchen thinking about all the ways I, I use the my the, my nimble hands every day but my feet 
have all those same similar bones and all that, you know, they, they came from that same degree of flexibility and nimbleness. And now I just asked them to like walk me a couple of miles to work and back. And, and that's hard for the foot <laughs> and the foot sort of breaks down as a result and gives us a lot of pain as a result. And that's all born out of that switch to bipedalism. So yeah. the book's really about trade-offs and compromise kind of all the way through on, with issues like that. Yeah. What about fingernails? Why, why did those evolve? I mean, I think- or And toenails for that matter. Yeah, those, those had to have, I haven't read as much about, about those structures, but I, those had to have come up from, from early, early, early mammalian days when, you know, when our, when our lineage was, was scrabbling around on, on trees. I mean, the, the, the primate lineage comes out of these kind of squirrel-like critters that, um, that must have used those structures to help them grip and grasp. And I would imagine also to defend themselves. So that's, I haven't, that's one I haven't thought about as much, but that's kind of the, that, that goes, goes back a long way to, to even pre mammals and, and the sort of structures that you see on the, you know, the, mm-hmm keratinized structures as, as mam- mammals are be- or as animals are becoming mammals um so they might so, be yeah. more like claw remnants rather than things that evolved yeah exactly themselves. so yeah that's exactly. yeah that makes sense so you mentioned the two big things being bipedalism and the big brains and i, I would agree with that but it also seems like uh for, from what i've read the the big brains couldn't have come without bipedalism or at least that they came later so yeah so bipedalism it's, it's more energetically efficient. And it, it's funny, um, you described the, the how, how we found that out, like putting a, a chimpanzee on yeah. a treadmill, uh, the scientists doing that in a lab. It's just very yeah. funny to imagine. Yeah. So, I, was one of, I was one of them in that experiment because they made the chimps run. They had the chimps walk quadrupedally and bipedally for that experiment and then measured, measured all the VO2 max and all these energetic things. But I don't think that, I think they only had the humans walk or walk, run bipedally. And that didn't seem fair to me. Like, I think they should have also made the humans get down and <laughs> get after it quadrupedally to see what they discovered, you know? Cause if you recall that part of the book, there was one chimp in the study that was more efficient walking bipedally. They, were, they nicknamed her Lucy, of course, after the famous fossil. And it always made me wonder like, I wonder how many humans you'd have to get on a treadmill before you found a human that was more efficient quadrupedally. <laughs> Yeah, that would be funny. Maybe it's an IRB issue. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That would be a hard one to slip by the IRB committee. Yeah. So, so was was the main advantage at first the it being more energetically efficient, or was it the the hands were free, or do you think it was both at the same time, or do you think it was neither of those and it was diet? Or yeah, I think I, I think the diet is the most likely option. I mean, I, I just think about an animal that's sort of stuck up in the trees. Why would they leave the trees? And, and to me, that, that how almost has to be the answer that they ran out of things to eat. Like, I mean, either something came into the trees that was going to eat them or they ran out of things to eat in the trees. And, and there is evidence that when that transition occurred, there was significant climate change happening in Africa at the time. And that, that that's the current leading hypothesis, at least as I understand it, that, um, that, that a, some kind of transition in diet forced this change in environment where humans had to get out of the trees. And then, and then it becomes a question of like, all right, well, how did bipedalism help them more on the ground? And, and yeah, I think it was a, it was a more efficient way of covering long distances. Chimpanzees fatigue, really, you know, quadrupedal primates fatigue pretty quickly when asked to go any kind of considerable amount of distance. And as, as food became more scattered and you had to travel longer distances, it was, um, it, it must have just been a, an easier, more efficient way to do it. I'll, I'll put in a plug for a, one of the guy, one of the scientists I lean on kind of heavily in this book um, is the foot anthropology expert in the country right now, Jeremy De Silva, and he just wrote a book called First Steps. I just am about a chapter two into it. I started it just recently, and it's all about this issue and how humans first started taking bipedal steps and why they did. And it's really good. It's it, it, like right away. It's it's and I, I don't think you get a lot of science books that are like this, especially ones written by the expert, like an expert in the field. Those tend to be a little drier and more academic. His is really fun and accessible, like right right from the jump. And and anybody that really liked the middle section of 
my book, I would, I would say, Hey, go, go read first steps as a follow-up. And I think you'll really like it. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So we, we've, we've pretty much covered the first two sections. And then the last one is on, on babies and reproduction. So one, one of them is pretty obvious, you know, walking bipedally, uh, not only, I guess our, our hip orientation is it, it makes giving birth harder, but then our heads get bigger, uh, as, as our brains get bigger. So that, that one's kind of obvious. Uh, the less obvious ones, you talk about um, you you talk about reproduction itself and and evolutionary pressures uh, in in things there. Yeah, that I, I kick off that section with a chapter on menstruation, and that was the hardest chapter for me to write because I think it was the physiologically it's the hardest issue to understand in the book why it evolved and the. The first thing to kind of recognize with mammals is that you have to, with that issue, is that you have to you have to divide them into two camps. You have the majority of mammals, the bulk of mammals, they change their uterine linings um, only in response to pregnancy. So all the cellular changes that take place in the uterus for pregnancy, they don't do it until they get pregnant. That's the vast, vast majority of mammals, um, like 95%. And then you have humans and most and the old world primates and a few new world and then a couple other random animals like elephant shrews and some bats that change their uterine linings in preparation for pregnancy. Even before pregnancy, that uterine lining starts to undergo these significant cellular changes, making different proteins and doing all this preparation for pregnancy. And then if pregnancy doesn't happen, then it's, it's a path of no return. Those, those cells can't rewind and go back. All that tissue and all that blood just has to be sloughed and just has to be gotten rid of. And then you rinse and repeat and start over. So then the question kind of becomes, well, why, why do that? Like, why, why change that uterine lining just before pregnancy? And in, in preparation for. And so that's an issue I get into, into that chapter. And there's a couple really, really interesting ideas and hypotheses that, that there is starting to become some solid evidence in support of for, for why that happens. Mm -hmm. And the main one is that it's kind of like this arms race, right? So the baby tries to, to implant even deeper and get even more nutrients. And then the mother tries to kick it out, kick it out, unless it's going to be like the, the, the one that ends up surviving. Yeah, there's this there's this kind of give and take between the mother and the child where the fetus just wants to root in there as deep as it can and kind of suck the mother dry. And, and it leads to these significant issues of pregnancy, like gestational diabetes and preeclampsia where, where the fetus is manipulating the mother's physiology to such a degree that it can even imperil the mother. And so one of the ideas about why the uterine lining changes in preparation for is that it gives the mother a, a little bit of a time to build up her uterine defenses before pregnancy so that she can kind of get ahead of it before the fetus is even in there trying to just burrow 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 deep 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 into her and it's a, it's a degree of placentation in humans that's that's quite unique amongst mammals where the fetus burrows in there all the way in there next to her blood vessels so that it can secrete hormones and, and, and do things to manipulate the mother's physiology. And that's one of the current thoughts about why menstruation evolved is that, is that that uterine lining is a defense against the fetus. And then when, if there's no pregnancy, then uh, that whole sort of defensive wall just has to be sloughed out. And then you rinse and repeat again the next month. It's really, I think it's just fascinating because it's this topic that, that half the population goes through, but nobody really talks about like why, you know, how it came to be or, 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 and I think very few people understand how it came to be. Yeah. I guess this is where our, our differences uh, in interest are showing. Cause, cause I, I don't have too much of a, of, I don't, I don't have too much of a background in biology, but I am really interested in the behavioral stuff. And in the next chapter, you talk about how there are like these, these subconscious behavioral differences, depending on, on, when women are ovulating both from women and from men. And yeah. then, um, and you mentioned this one very, very out there uh, strip club study by, by Joffrey Miller. And so, so 
Could you could you summarize uh, the the findings of that that you talk about? Sure. So he he was interested in knowing if there were changes in in men's behavior based on where women are in their cycle. Effectively, are are women giving off any kind of cues that let men know where they are in their cycle, or is is ovulation truly you know hidden in humans? And so he hit upon this idea of studying women that worked as dancers at a club and measuring their measuring their like keeping track of their tips based on where they were in their cycle so he had these these women join the study and they they charted their cycle for for a few months and and then also kept track of their tips and what he found was that that the women that were sort of at peak fertility, so sort of right at this this moment when they would be ovulating, those were the women that were making the that were making the largest amount of tips, and ones that were sort of in the menstrual part of their cycle were making the least amount of tips, and then the other ones in like the luteal phase, kind of in between, were making an, an intermediate amount of tips, and it's just this fascinating result that shows like yes, there is clearly some kind of signal, but. To me, it's the thing that leaves a, almost may, maybe this is the, the case with good research. Like it almost leaves more questions after the research than the number that you answered, because because you just don't know why is that happening? Is it happening due to a change in the woman's behavior? Um, is it doing? Is it happening? Is it is it purely a, a hormonal thing? The a cue that the man is picking up on, and and he's tipping more as a result because of some hormone that's influencing him. We and we don't know the answer to that, but it is this really really interesting result. Yeah, I had all those questions as well, and and the same author, uh, Joffrey Miller, wrote a book called The Mating Mind, where he talks about um, uh, evolutionary psychology from from like a, a sexual selection angle, and I I was. I know you didn't talk about it in this book. Maybe maybe it could be something to consider in your next if, if you're planning on, on writing more someday. But I was wondering if you know of any any similar issues caused by sexual selection. So for example, in peacocks, you have this handicapping idea where the big beautiful tail is just like a hindrance, like it interferes yeah. with mobility and it costs a lot of energy to maintain. And like, you would think that evolution would select against it but then there's this handicap idea of you know only only the fittest can produce the most magnificent tail so it gets sexually selected for and in the mating mind uh joffrey miller was was making an argument for for saying that some of the things we develop that don't offer an obvious advantage like um like our capacity for art and language for example language beyond like basic communication uh, might have been due to sexual selection. And I was wondering your thoughts on that. And then also your thoughts on whether humans have any handicaps, kind of like the peacock's tail, that, that might be another case of sexual evolution gone wrong. Right. I think that's a really interesting. I just wrote, wrote down the name of it because I really like to hear about sort of new, interesting books to read about. And and I found his, his his paper it's so interesting that I'll be I'll have to check that out. Um, I think he's right that that. Uh, I mean, I'm always stressing to my students that I don't you know Darwin never said like survival of the fittest. It's this thing that's been sort of thrown on it afterwards. And I'm always stressing to my students that it's it's really all about reproduction. If you get to the end of the day and and the animal doesn't reproduce, it doesn't really matter how well they survived. Those traits are not going to get passed on. And obviously, for most animals, surviving is kind of critical to reproducing. But at the end of the day, it, what matters is did the animal reproduce? And you get these goofy animals like widow spiders or mantids or something that that for some animals, it's in their best interest to, to even die in the throes of reproduction because it means they reproduce more. So I think he's absolutely right that you have to um, view a lot of these issues through the lens of sexual selection rather than natural selection. And when you think about those topics of of our voice and and so many aspects of our appearance and 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 all these cultural things that have come up that we basically just use to impress females i i think you're dead on that 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 joffrey miller is is correct that that many aspects of our anatomy and and our behavior have been influenced by sexual selection instead of natural selection if i'm thinking about 
I, I don't have a handicap that necessarily comes to mind. I think handicap, like overt handicap traits, like what you see in a, a peacock are a little bit more rare. Um, but I, when I think about sexual selection, I, and sort of really interesting examples, I tend to more think of like sexual dimorphism where there are multiple strategies towards success. And, and I think that's much more of a common thing. There was, if you go all the way back to the start of our conversation, when I was talking about the different floors in the graduate um, program I was in, there was a lab on the, the, on the neuroethology floor, on the floor that was the interface of neurobiology and behavior that studied these midshipmen fish that live in the intertidal zones. And they have this crazy sexual dimorphism where like the males can either put all of their energy into their vocal apparatus and, and courting females and singing. Like they make this kind of low hum that draws the females in and they can either, so you can either go that strategy as you're going to suck in the females that way and, and impress the female midshipman fish that direction. And then there's other males that just put like all of their energy into testes size. They don't grow these, these large vocal cords at all. They just put it all into testes size and they let the type eight, the type one males or type A or whatever they're called, like do all the courting and the females come in to lay their eggs. And then the ones with the giant testes just like slip in there and flood the scene with sperm. And then they get a fair good chunk of the reproduction that way. And there are these two stable sexual strategies that have forever like been around and work in the midshipman fish. And I kind of think like, all right, well, is that, is that the kind of thing that has happened in humans? Like, are there kind of, is there, are there sort of two strategies toward, toward courting the opposite sex? And and I, I kind of take it more that angle rather than the handicap one. Yeah, wow, that, that's really interesting. Yeah, you should look up, you would, as a cognitive scientist, you would, you should look up some of that neuroethology, uh, neuroethology work. I think the second floor at NBNB at Neurobiology Behavior, you would find a lot of the work they do really, really interesting because it, it sounds like it kind of hits the sweet spot for you right there at that interface of neuroscience and behavior. Yeah, I'll check that out. So we're getting a bit close to the hour and a half. So I want to ask you, um, if, if there's anything else uh, that we haven't covered that you'd like to talk about. We've, we've done a good job covering the bases. I, um, I guess I just want to stress that I just think it's so important for, because I, I think a, a large part of your audience is probably, I would, I would think is you must have some undergraduates that are, that are going to be listening to this. And as a, professor and a teacher like I just think I, I I wrote this book because I I had discovered all these really interesting things that I wanted to get across to students and it wasn't a bunch of stuff that I could easily you know just fit into a class and I just want to stress to students to that you know just pick up a book like this and 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 just give it a chance because I get students that just haven't read a book in in so long and and we pick books, I try and pick books for them to read in classes, in my classes that are not textbooks that, that they'll just have a really positive experience reading. I, I have them read a book called Gut by Julia Enders. She's a, she's a German doctor. She's really young. She's done a ridiculous amount by, you know, at a really young age, but she wrote this incredible book called Gut that we read in my anatomy and physiology classes. And and the students just love it. And they have this really positive experience reading the book. And then I give them other book recommendations and they're off and running with this, this, this new sort of, this new habit of reading books. And I just hope that, that even if there's just a couple of students that pick up this book and, and develop that habit, then to me, that's, that, that makes the whole thing worth it. Yeah, and yours was very fun and, and easy to understand, I think. I'm wondering, is there a chance that, yours, that it, it's gonna be placed on, uh, you, you mentioned your college has, has like this this what what was the term for it the, the yeah, book we, they read every the, semester the, yeah the common read kind of thing yeah yeah is there any chance you'll be the next common read for bio yeah. students yeah that's a good question the 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 common read program and i would love it if if it could become a common read i think something i'm going to do in the next year because it'll be a year until it comes out in in paperback um, and i'm really always just aware of costs for students and price for students and so like i i'm i'm going to over the course of this year, I'm going to work to um, write a bunch of discussion questions and sort of write these sort of little additional pieces that that then professors and teachers can use to help supplement the book. So I'm hoping in a year when it comes out in paperback, the 
that it might be this kind of thing that could be picked up and used in classes and as a common read, that would really, I'd really find that neat. Yeah, and, and I was, my last question was gonna be what's next for you and that, that kind of covered it. So um, do you still do research or is it just the teaching and writing? I've, I've sort of set the research on the back burner for now. I, I was really into, you know, insect research for a number of years and I don't, I transitioned from doing all this chemical ecology research with, with moths in graduate school to a bunch of work on the color and ladybugs um, for a long time. But where I teach about 80% of your gig is, is teaching. So for the most part, I'm, I'm in the classroom a lot. So you kind of have to pick your, you know, you have to pick it, you have to be careful out of, to, you don't get a ton of time to do other things. So right now I'm kind of focused on, on, on writing and I'm enjoying it a lot. And we'll see if, uh, if this one is successful to any degree, I think I'll, I've got some ideas about, about other ones I'd like to write. So for now, I'm really happy doing that. That's great. Well, th thank you very much, Alex. Uh, this, this was great discussing your book, Evolution Gone Wrong. And I wish you the best of luck with, with, with spreading the word and with your future writing. And hopefully we can chat again one day if, if another book comes out. Thanks a lot, Adam. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. And I think it's, it's great, this podcast that you've started. I hope it spreads far and wide. And um, good luck with everything and, and stay in touch. Right. Touch.